You're listening to the Back Porch Talk Podcast. Danny and Jason had many discussions and debates on the back porch while making pivotal investment moves with assets. That's right, with trading cards. They welcome you to the back porch and right into those discussions about current sports news with a fresh and unique twist. So come on and join us. Welcome to the Bad Porch Top Podcast. I'm your host, Jason. This is your host, Danny. And fans, we have a full show for you today, so let's get to it. A little NBA talk here about those Brooklyn Nets still in the news, and a little bit about the uh, Lakers in more ways than one. And then we're going to a little bit uh, HBCU news, a football season is upon us coming up on Saturday. Looking forward to it. And then we have an intriguing trading car scenario. But first, Danny, the, to the NBA, in where, unfortunately, Chet Holmgren, the second overall pick of the 2022 NBA draft, uh, will be out for the season due to a foot injury. Uh, looks like it's a Liz Frank uh, injury, on his obviously, on his foot, uh, and where he was trying to uh, guard LeBron James. Uh, seems like LeBron James was not even going half speed, but nonetheless, Chet Holmgren seems to have landed wrong, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, is out this season. Uh, what say you? Yeah, very unfortunate uh, for Chet Holmgren. He was having a great summer league, great off season, rookie off season. You know, getting ready for his first year, and unfortunately, this happened in a pro am. Of all things, so it's tough. It's going to be a tough year for him to sit out and watch everything go down. But hopefully, he recovers soon and he'll be back on the court, and we can actually see what he's about. The interesting trade in where the Los Angeles Lakers, your Lakers, has acquired none other than Pat Beverly in a trade that was announced where the Lakers are actually going to send. Taylor and Horton Tucker and for Stanley Johnson to the jazz. Um, Danny, there's obviously a history between Pat Bev and Russell Westbrook, man. This all really started back in, in 2013 NBA playoffs. I believe Pat Bev was with the Houston Rockets and Russell was with the uh, OKC Thunder. Mm-hmm. And it was a, during a call timeout. And where you know how the guards tend to run over to the side with the ball, call a timeout, and then ultimately they go into a timeout. Well, Pat Bev decided to go full steam at the ball, (laughs) thus the knees of Russell Westbrook, Mm -hmm. ending up tearing, I believe, his meniscus. Yes, he did. Uh, And so there's always some been some bad blood. And that's, again, back in 2013. So we're talking almost 10 years here of some bad blood between the two. This is going to be must-see TV, Danny. This is the new documentary I want to see in the practice. <laughs> we don't know what the hell going to happen between Russell Westbrook and Pat Brev. Now, this is all contingent upon Russell Westbrook still being on the roster. Well, there's some rumors that Russell Westbrook would not be on the roster. He may get traded. I don't know. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Those are the rumors. Nonetheless, as it stands right now, Pat Bev and Russell Westbrook are on the same squad. This is going to be interesting. I remember Russell Westbrook actually mentioning in an interview in where (laughs) he talked about how Pat Bev has tricked y'all. And I quote, Pat Bev tricked y'all, man. He said some other things. Then he ultimately said, he just he's just running around doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, boy, this is gonna be some must see <laughs> TV, boy. I tell you, what's going to be really interesting though is who's going to start and who's going to finish the game. Mm-hmm. How is it going to be talked about at the end of each game? That is going to be some heavy competition, man. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how this all shakes out. I can even see them being on the floor together. Yep. 
I really can. I can see them be on the floor together, possibly having uh, LeBron play, play the three. Mm-hmm. I mean, AD can play the four or five. I mean, this is going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. What say you, Danny? Jason, I saw the news come through last night, uh, unofficially at first, and then they made it official. And I think it's a great pickup for the late. It's tough to see THT leave Taylor Horton Tucker because he has a lot of talent and he's young. So it's a trade off, right? Where LeBron is looking, trying to win now. And I thought they could have kept him, but to bring in someone like Pat Bev, who who's a veteran, who knows how to win, who will push all the right buttons, someone that's going to be there for you. And I know there's a lot of history with Pat Bev <laughs> and Westbrook, but I think if Westbrook is on the roster, they're going to make it work. They may not like each other per se, but I think they'll make it work. And I do definitely see them both being on the court. It'll be a small backcourt, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the two of them, but they're feisty. They're mm-hmm. going to give it their all. And if they stay healthy, you know, it, it would help from the playoff perspective. The problem is, like I said in the last show, is depth. They must have something else planned here to mm-hmm. acquire somebody else to fill out that bench. But all in all, I think it's a good trade. From a leadership veteran perspective, it's a bad trade from a you're losing another young player who has some pretty good talent. So Utah's, you know, starting from the they're starting to do a little rebuild in front of our eyes. Mm-hmm. So that was a nice piece for them to pick up. And so from one coast of the United States, we're going on the other coast of the United States <laughs> and where there's some more drama happening in the Brooklyn Nets and where KD uh and the management crew of Brooklyn has decided to move forward together. The NBA needs to do an investigation. I think it's that time, man. I want to know what the hell was actually agreed upon between KD, Kyrie, and the Brooklyn Nets. For Kyrie to actually indicate at the at the end of the year press conference that him and KD and the management team, including the general manager and and the uh, governor, Josiah, mm-hmm. to have discussions about how we plan to move forward. What is that all about? I want to know if if Kyrie and KD has maybe a small ownership stake, potentially with the Brooklyn Nets. But for that to be said, and it seems like it's holding true, mm-hmm. I'm just really curious as to What's really happening behind the scenes here? Um, I didn't think Katie was going was going anywhere um, necessarily after a while because the the pot got too rich, if you will, mm-hmm. for the trade to actually happen. Yep. I didn't think any of the teams were going to give up that many pieces and, and those many draft picks to ultimately get KD. Nonetheless, man, I, Brooklyn is stacked. This is going to be an interesting eastern conference regular season i don't know i think the nba needs to do some kind of investigation and if not an investigation oh boy wait until this next cba agreement between the nba players association and the governors of these franchises ben simmons john wall james harden all these players, I, I think, have really messed things up from the standpoint of uh, player empowerment. Now they're calling it calling it player entitlement, or there needs to be a different differentiation between the two. Yeah. Nonetheless, these governors are actually going to, I believe, really push for certain items when it comes to contracts and salaries in the next CBA. What say you, Danny? So with KD, Jason, there was an interesting scenario that came up before he had this meeting earlier this week with the governors um, where he was proposed, Memphis was proposing a trade, was the rumor. Mm -hmm. That would have been an interesting fit. Mm -hmm. I actually would have liked KD down in Memphis. Mm -hmm. Um, But he's staying, according to him, 
they have something going on here. It's, something has to come to light Somewhere. because who's pulling strings, who's doing what, all the stuff with Kyrie and them to- the toleration level of some of the stuff that's going on as well mm-hmm. makes you wonder what kind of wink, wink, not, not, or mm-hmm. something in, in writing that's we don't, we're not privy to, to see mm-hmm. that it's like you said, and we talked about, do they have a minority? Are they promised something? Mm-hmm. Are they currently getting something that feel that KD felt some type of way where he didn't get his way. So he felt he needed to be traded. Mm-hmm. Or is it uh, Steve Nash is Sean Marks or me kind of thing? So there is some something going on here, and I think eventually it'll come to light. It may not be in the foreseeable future, but there's just too much going on here. There's a lot of smoke that someone's not going to sit here and take a look at this and see what's going on um, and do some digging. But right now, KD is staying with Brooklyn and. They had some workout videos with Kyrie, so they were getting ready for the season. And this is going to be very interesting, Danny. Just as you say, Kyrie, KD, Joe Harris may be coming back off of injury here. The Brooklyn Nets are stacked. Uh, they're loaded uh, and everything. So this is going to be interesting, man. I definitely believe that they could be in the top four in the Eastern Conference. I still have the likes of Milwaukee, our Milwaukee Bucks being number one mm-hmm. in that one or two slot. Regular season, anything can happen, right? But I see the Milwaukee Bucks in that one two slot, uh, along with, I hate to say it, the likes of the Boston Celtics. Yep. Uh, but you also have the Philadelphia 76ers who made some interesting moves during the offseason here. Uh, I can see them being in the mix. Um, and then, like I mentioned, Brooklyn Nets in the mix. That's your top four. Uh, and then from there, I, I mean, I don't have that full faith and confidence in the Chicago Bulls, quite honestly. Um, but they'll be in the top eight. Uh, the likes of the Toronto Raptors, I think they may be in the mix here. Uh, but then also, um, you're going to have – the Atlanta Hawks kind of intrigued me a little bit there too. I think they may try to do something here. I don't know about the Charlotte Hornets with everything going on. I honestly believe that they're going to kind of fall by the wayside here. Once again, uh, I don't know what Jordan and them are doing. Cup check. I don't know what they're doing, but this is definitely not their fault in terms of what's happened off the court here. Uh, But I don't know about the New York Knicks. They're still suspect to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't mention the Miami Heat. Miami Heat's going to be in the mix there some way, somehow. Uh, those, to me, are going to be in your, in your top eight. What say you, Danny? Jason, I, looking at my list here, I, I agree with you. I think Cleveland's another team to watch out for mm-hmm. since they're a younger, scrappier team. They're like the Brooklyn Nets before KD and Kyrie got there. That's the way I look at them. So they have some talent, some youth. Uh, Atlanta with DeJounte Murray coming into the fold mm-hmm. is definitely an interesting pickup. They did lo- lose Hoarder, which is a shooter, to Sacramento. So that may impact them from spreading the floor, but Trey Young does that already because he shoots mm-hmm. from like the logo. Out. <laughs> he has that type of range. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, I see it the same way. Washington may be another team as well that may sneak into that top eight, top 10, depending on health Uh, so all this is predicated on health and how these teams uh, push through the regular season but yeah i I can see definitely see the bucks celtics brooklyn philly in that top four miami sitting on the outside losing pj tucker i think is going to be a bigger uh loss than people are giving it so it they're still a tough nosed team and they'll be around Mm -hmm. and then now on to the likes of these Lakers once again, just as there's some drama happening on the team with Pat Beverly actually being traded to the Los Angeles Lakers. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot happening in the film industry too, with the Lakers as of right now, Hulu has a documentary series called legacy uh, that is currently out. 
which is fantastic, by the way. You have the actual footage, the actual interview footage uh, from back in the day. You have the likes of Jerry Buss talking about how he actually got the Lakers, how he ensured that the Lakers organization survived even during difficulties financially. This has been actually a great docu-series on the Los Angeles Lakers. You have the actual interviews of all the players um, back in the 79, 78, when when ultimately Magic comes on the scene, when Jerry Buss actually gets, gets the organization. Man, this has just been awesome. And it really reminded me, as I was watching the first two episodes, it took me back to the Showtime series, or excuse me, the winning time series on HBO, uh, which is a little bit more Hollywood. You have mm-hmm. actors acting as the players uh, in Dolls, so a little bit more Hollywood. Um, there has been lawsuits, uh, to my understanding, from uh, Jerry West and others um, mm-hmm. in where they're de- being depicted in not the uh, most favorable uh, light, if you will. Yeah. Nonetheless, Danny, in looking at the Hulu series and his HBO series, the premise is the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it really, really mirrors one another. Yep. The facts are there. Yes, Winning Time has a little bit more of a Hollywood flavor to it, of course. But the basis is there. And then ultimately, Magic Johnson comes out with his own uh, docu-series, They Call Me Magic, which was which is on uh, Apple TV+. Plus. So, man, this has just been a summer for the Lakers in more ways than one on and off the court. Yep. The beauty that I, I see, though, within this docu-series on Hulu, man, Jerry Buss did a lot, Danny. He did a whole lot. When you Mm -hmm. talk about the financial difficulties that the Lakers were in and where he actually uh, put the name, naming rights on an arena. So it went from the form to the great Western form. And he got money for that to help pay off some of the debt, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. That was at the time, it seemed like one of the first times in the NBA or in general that that has happened. Um, so he's a true trailblazer. The other thing that he did to generate some funds uh, was having a local a local outlet to show it, the games. Mm-hmm. Only about 17,000, 18,000 people can fit in the arena, he said. Do yeah. you have so many more Lakers fans wanting to see the Lakers? And so he had this local TV um, outlet um, to distribute basically uh the games uh and he got some money off of it so man this is a true trailblazer uh some things that i definitely didn't know uh and all but man these all these series has been great um nuanced in its own respective way but uh very interesting for the lakers on and off the court when say you danny they've done a great job and you wonder why it's taking so long for the, for some of these things to come to fruition, but I'm glad they did because they're from our era. So we get to see a lot of behind the scenes um, footage. And like you said, information being dispersed, you get to see a lot, a lot about people's character as well and how they handle situations. Because in our day, we didn't, whatever was reported via the newspapers, how we pretty much got the news or on you know, TV news, but now with social media, you get privy to a lot of information very quickly. And usually the players can, you know, dispel rumors and things like that, or put stuff out there so you can consume it and battle it against whoever's reporting and making a report. Mm -hmm. Uh, But this Saturday, my beloved fam, you will be playing the UNC uh, Tar Heels. And uh, it actually uh, kicks off the season. They call it week zero. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is considered the HBCU celebration game. 
uh, and where again UNC will play my beloved Florida AM Rattlers. Uh, and this is going to happen at uh, 8 p.m. Um, and it's going to be televised on the ACC network. So I'm looking forward to actually uh, watching this game uh, and all uh, some interesting news is where our coach, Coach Willie Simmons, has actually announced that uh, Jeremy Musa is going to be the starting quarterback. Uh, so the moose is loose. Uh, we will see what happens here. Um, a surprise to some that he is actually dubbed the starter. Uh, but nonetheless, I think this is going to be a very interesting game. I hope that we play uh, a very clean game, uh, not mm -hmm. that many turnovers, uh, so that way we can remain competitive. And I'm calling the upset here, Danny. A lot of people is talking about a 30-point difference here and where UNC will actually uh, beat us. But I'm calling uh, an upset here, man. I think this is going to be a closer game than what people give it. and uh, I am going with my Florida a and Rattlers to win this game. Uh, I think we're going to go into uh, UNC. Uh, there's going to be a large contingent of Rattlers in the building wearing the orange and green. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Marching 100, to my understanding, will be there as well. Uh, I don't think the UNC fans are ready. I don't think the team is ready. Yeah. I think we're going to upset these cats. What say you, Danny? <laughs> Jason, this one, uh, with this being the celebration game, like you mentioned, they have both marching bands are going to be there. They're going to do pregame, halftime show. There's going to be a lot of recognition going on pregame from um, FAMU side, so and then from the North Carolina side as well. So it's it's a whole weekend of activities for those of you who are, are not aware of this. You can Google it, HBCU Celebration Game, and you'll see, like, they have a whole itinerary starting on Friday through the whole weekend uh, outside of the game as well. From the game perspective, Jay, this is one where if they're going to sneak one, this is the one. Because you just don't know. It's the first game. It's going to be, yep. you know, they got the jitters. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. If you're going to sneak a game, this is the game to this get. This is it. This is it. Yep. And keeping them healthy ahead of the next uh, next week's game mm -hmm. is what you really want mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. with Jackson State. So they they have a shot. I'm not discounting that at all. I just think um, if North Carolina comes out shaky, they better, they better strike like you always mention. I know that's your mantra. <laughs> and get them up, up get them up right. front, get them front, get them up That's front. Right. Cause they, they have a good opportunity here, man, to um, get their name out there and get on the map. So this is no better way to do this versus a, a top 20. I think North Carolina is ranked 22 preseason. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this will be a great upset from that perspective as well. And, and I have to say this, man, I think our defense is ready. Uh, mm -hmm. We have Isaiah Land. This is an opportunity for him to shine, as well as other uh, NFL prospect players to shine. Um, this is that money game uh, mm -hmm. in more ways than one. These players are going to get their money uh, in this particular game. And I believe that the uh, North Carolina quarterback, this is his first start as well. Exactly. So if there's yeah. ever a time to uh, go ahead and get one, this is it. Exactly. And now, Danny, on to an interesting trading card scenario. Who we got? So, Jason, with our the U.S. Open upcoming, we wanted to do a comparison between Pete Sampras and Roger Federer. So a couple quick bios. Pete Sampras won 14 majors. So Australian Opens, Wimbledon's, and U.S. Opens. He did not win the French Open. Uh, he has 66 career titles. Singles and his singles record was 762 and 222. Roger Federer won 20 majors, and his overall singles record was 1245 and 275 with 103 career titles. Jason, who do you want in your portfolio? Danny, this was an interesting one. I went back and forth on uh, these two athletes actually uh played once uh in the 2001 Wimbledon uh and where Federer actually prevailed in the five set uh in the round of 16 mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And Federer was uh, really at the beginning of his career at that point in time. Um, And when his first major about two years later, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Sampras uh, was in the latter part of his career uh, and he actually retired the following year. Uh, So, Danny, I have to say this, man, this was interesting because Sampras uh, at one point in time was uh, the one, um, you know, doing things big, if you will. Yeah. But for Federer to win so many Grand Slams in the midst of the big three where you had Mm -hmm. your uh, Novak Djokovic and Rafael Nadal. And they're still going at it. They're still going back and forth, right? Mm-hmm. I think I can tell a very intriguing story about uh, Roger Federer during that time. Uh, so I'm going to have to go with Roger Federer just on account that whoever comes out as the most Grand Slam title wins between uh, or amongst those three. Mm-hmm. I can still tell the story that Federer was in the mates. What say you? Pete Sampras came up during our time when we were younger. And he was he turned pro when he was 16. Federer turned pro when he was 17. And Sampras was dominant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But Federer was on a different level of dominant. And he just, over that span of time, man, he was tough. Mm-hmm. And he battled, and obviously you can see by the career wins what he did and how successful he was. Federer was, he dominated pretty much on every surface as well. Mm-hmm. So grass, uh, not so much, but everything else, Federer was the man. To keep this quick, I was thinking Sampras at first. I wanted to go with Sampras, but I'm going to have to go Federer as well. Thank you for joining us at Backports Talk Podcast. You can also join us on Twitter by tweeting us at back underscore podcast. For more information, you can go to our website, which is backportstalkpodcast.com. You can also email us at backportstalkpodcast at gmail.com. Again, thank you for joining us. And remember that there's enough hate in the world. So go ahead and spread a little love.